In the summer of 1969, half a century ago, police violently raided the Stonewall Inn in New York City. Police raids on gay bars were common, but this time, something changed. The LGBTQ patrons and passers-by, many of them people of colour, fought back, sparking days of rioting. Then they began organising. They birthed the modern gay liberation movement and pride, which is now a global phenomenon. This is Working Class History. Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. The Stonewall Riots, or Stonewall Rebellion, took place in 1969, 50 years ago this June. Though there'd been protests against police raids at gay bars in the US beforehand, uh, for example at Compton's Cafeteria in San Francisco in 1966, and in LA in 1967 uh, outside the Black Cat Bar, Stonewall was different. Firstly because of its militancy and the extent of the violence in terms of confrontation with the police and destruction of property. Secondly, it wasn't just a one-off protest or incident, it lasted for six days. Thirdly, it was reported about at the time in the mainstream press, and it had a couple of photographs taken, unlike the previous ones. And most importantly, the participants and the local LGBT community used the event as a springboard to organise. They set up the Gay Liberation Front, which revolutionised the LGBT rights movement, and they organised a demonstration on the anniversary of the first night of the riot, which became Pride a huge event each June, which takes place all over the world. We were really pleased to be able to get in touch with a couple of people who were involved in the Stonewall Rebellion and who were happy to speak with us about their experiences. One of them was Martin Boyce. Well, I was uh, born into the working class. My father was a cab driver, and uh, I grew up with an Italian family. My father married an Italian, so I almost consider myself Italian, though my name is Boyce because I was raised with them. And my father is an English-American Catholic, so I'm of a Catholic background, too, culturally Catholic. I was uh, born in the village. Uh, I was born in St. Vincent's Hospital, but I was raised on 43rd Street and 2nd Avenue near the UN. Oh, my life situation in 1969 was my mother was an invalid, and my father wanted to work to gain his pension. So I, they sent me to college, and also I would take care of my mother in return for taking care of my mother, I, would, I went to college and uh, also had a great deal of time in the night when my mother was asleep to go out. So that was my connection to the streets. I mean, you know, I always knew I was gay. So I just studied straight people as a child to learn how to act, to fool them. Also growing up in New York City at the time was John O'Brien. The group he mentions, the NAACP, is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. I was born in Harlem, New York, and grew up in Harlem, New York. My parents were laborers. My mother was one of 13 children uh, born in Ireland, and uh, parents of her could not afford to feed and clothe and take care of 13 kids, so the majority were sent to the United States. So basically, um, she worked as a maid her whole life, and uh, my father was a custodian. Uh, So uh, Irish ancestry, very poor, uh, horrible housing uh, in old walk-ups that uh, were built during the Civil War of the United States in the 1860s. Um, there was no bathroom <clears throat> in several of these places we lived. They, they, the bathtub was the kitchen sink, and you walked down the hall to, to where there was a toilet. So they were old, old buildings, and they were tearing them down. So I got radicalized because of that because of the conditions I saw around me, particularly on how uh, people of color were depicted in being, and being, um, um, what's the word I want to use, uh, abused um, by both locally, discriminated, and watching the news on um, what was going on in the South. So, so at the age of 13, on my own, I went up to the Harlem branch of the NAACP on 125th Street, and I went in there to join the group, which surprised a lot of the people in the office. So I I got involved in 1962 in the Civil Rights Movement and um, basically learned a great deal. And one of the things that happened is that I came in contact with other social classes because um, that movement saved my life. All the kids in my neighborhood grew up with no hope, no future, many 
made them turn to drugs. And it's because I cared about helping people that I actually helped myself. So I'm self-taught. I never, um, never finished high school because I went to Heron High School, which was the second worst high school in New York. And, um, and basically there you didn't learn much at all. Over the river in Brooklyn was Martha Shelley, who was five years older than John. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Um, my father was an, Im- well, his family were immigrants, but he was also born in Brooklyn and working class people. Uh, and my mother was an illegal immigrant. Uh, when her family came, there was a, an immigration quota so that uh, they couldn't get in. They went to Cuba instead. And then uh, that, at that point, she was seven. And then when she was 16, she got on a boat, came to the United States, and went to work in a factory in New York. Uh, She met my father, and he was a citizen, so they got married, and she was able to become a citizen. Martha's mom was Jewish and from Poland. And those members of her family that did not leave Poland uh, were killed in the Holocaust. While the 1960s is now kind of often remembered as a time of freedom and sexual liberation, um, for LGBTQ people, this was not really the case at all. Uh, persecution of gay and gender non-conforming people was rife, both by the state and the general population, although the extent of this depended on class. It differed depending upon who you were and where you were. So class-wise, if you didn't have a great deal of money, it was worse for you. When I was a kid growing up, I understood that I was a criminal, I was religiously sinful, and mentally sick at the same time. Uh, There was nothing available for me to learn about me because uh, there certainly was no billboards, no television shows, nobody who was out who was in any way positive was a role model. And so when I went to the library, public library, there was nothing in the public shelves. The only thing for sexuality, that stuff was closed stacks. And if you were young, you weren't allowed access to it. So there was nothing there for me. And there was no organized gay community. And, um, but there was no support system. And when I went out looking for sex, I went to places where they said that's where the degenerates and perverts were. Oh, well, the oppression was ubiquitous. I mean, it was everywhere. The oppression could come up 20 times a day. You just live with it. Just hope to get out of the, sometimes it was dangerous, sometimes mere humiliation. I remember going to um, a hardware store, even though I wanted something completely different, the man showed me how uh, a female and a male's electrical sockets work, that the prongs go into the, he called the female part, just to show me, give me a lesson on life in front of all these other people, just to humiliate me. That was just one minor, that was just minor because there was no violence or something like that. But incidents like that would occur all day. There was like no such thing as pride because pride could get you beaten. But we understood where the pride was. It was below the surface. It was our ability to resist. It was like being in the French resistance. It was it was a lot to deal with and dealt with very well. New York was the most liberal city in the entire country. But that's uh, and I think Ralph Ellison, the black writer, uh, on his monument uptown where he lived. It said that New York was the freest city, but that's different from being a free city. But it was the freest city you could live in as far as being gay and a number of other kind of people could live here or manage to live here pretty well. It had a good reputation for gay people to live. But that was not saying much when living at the time was very, very dangerous, very, very difficult. I mean, beating up gay people was a city sport. And there were certain days when they were just given the green light to do it. And St. Patrick's was one of those days. So if you went to a policeman or you were in trouble or something, you would get no help. In fact, they would blame you or sometimes hold you for them to beat you up. So, I mean, it was pretty horrible. It was, But still, it was very exciting at the same time. The city was like a film noir city. It was much darker than it is now. And it was sort of like a film noir life. We were called the Twilight People, but sometimes for good reason because our lives really were lived at night. So, I mean, there's a long history here of, uh, of, of how gays were mistreated, uh, fired from their jobs, uh, hounded, harassed, abused, and murdered. Nobody was ever being convicted of murdering gay people. 
you were rarely charged if you murdered a gay person. If you physically attacked a gay person, no charges were ever brought against you. So if you go back, you'll find that people were not brought up on charges for assaulting or hurting or murdering gays. I was lucky because I lived in Manhattan. Now, if I had lived in Alabama or Ohio or some other place, it was far worse. People came from Cleveland, Ohio to New York City to go to gay bars, the few that were opened occasionally. Um, there was generally very few gay places, and those that did have such places were generally um, attacked by police, and, uh, and not just nicely in raids, and uh, people would be losing their jobs, etc., as well as being in prison. It's far worse than what the official records are. Because when I was a kid, and, and for many long years after that, uh, parents could take their children that they discovered were gay and commit them to a mental asylum. Uh, others would be rounded up and locked up as criminals for violating various laws, if found. A year before I was born, in the state of Alabama, uh, these police broke down a door of a, in a house that two adult males were living in in their bed. They were found in bed together. They were arrested. And within a year, they were electrocuted to death underneath the sodomy law. As in much of the world, homophobia in the US had its origins in British colonialism. As in all of its colonies, Britain introduced sodomy laws and introduced the death penalty for it in Jamestown, its first permanent settlement. And as in much of the British Empire, post-colonial authorities didn't repeal the homophobic laws. So up to 1963, consensual sex between adult men was a crime in all 50 states of the US, with penalties of up to 60 years imprisonment. Some states also interpreted these laws to prohibit lesbian sex as well. If you were convicted under these laws, not only would you probably lose your job, you would lose most types of professional registration uh, you know, for your career, and depending on your state, you could also be locked up in a mental institution for life, given things like electroshock therapy, lobotomized, or chemically castrated. From 1963 onwards, a small number of states began repealing these laws, but in the late 60s, most states still had them, and they were only eventually completely struck down by the Supreme Court in 2003. Homosexual solicitation and wearing clothing for other than your gender designated by the state were also illegal, and police entrapment was rife. So in New York in the late 60s, police were arresting over 100 men a week for solicitation after entrapment operations. So facing all of this repression from the state and the general population, most LGBT people hid their sexuality. They were hiding in the closet. And in fact, almost all were hiding in the closet. There were very few that were out. The very, the very few who were out who were flamboyant couldn't do anything about <laughs> but being out. They didn't hold regular jobs, and they lived as basically sex workers on the streets. So um, and when I was a kid, there was, uh, as I said, not only wasn't there any support, there was lots of oppression. And it was organized, both in terms of government oppression, both in terms of religious institutional oppression, and, and societal oppression at all levels. For many lesbians, life was even harder. Lesbians were particularly isolated at that time, uh, far more than gay men, because the um, gay men had it was easier to go out and have sex and to uh, hang around in cruising areas than women, um, for obvious reasons at the time. Women had, just for being women, um, you know, have always had the uh, problem of uh, male violence. So, in fact, before I left home, one of the things I did was study judo uh, in the hopes that that would be some protection. Um, I think there was always uh, additional violence against anyone who was perceived to be gay or lesbian. The culture was such that uh, when I told a, a therapist that I was uh, lesbian, she said, well, you shouldn't be lesbian because uh, you're cutting off half the world. 
and therefore I should be bisexual. Now, she did not apply herself that to herself. She was hetero. And all of the people who, in that group of people that I knew who were uh, involved in this, it was kind of a therapy cult. Uh, if you were straight, that was fine. But if you were gay, they pressured you to be bisexual. So, uh, And as far as I was concerned, I wasn't interested in whether I was cutting off half the world or not. I only wanted one person. Not <laughs> I didn't want to go to bed with the whole world. Uh, so there was a lot of psychological pressure, even in uh, New York City where you were less likely to get killed for being gay than in other places at that time. Homophobia was even widespread amongst supposedly revolutionary socialists. I was a member of the Young Socialist Alliance, which was the youth group of the U.S. Socialist Workers Party. And I had been a member of it for several years. And I was called into the organizer's office because they had heard from a person they found out to be gay who then gave me my name to them, that I was gay. And they asked me if I was gay, and they were hoping I would say no, because I had these big muscles. I couldn't have possibly been gay, from their view. And I was one of their few actual working-class kids, because most of them were college kids, you know, professionals and stuff. So I told them I was gay, and they kicked me out because I, cause I said I was gay. They kicked me out because they said, well, I would be a security risk. And I said to them, well, how can I be a security risk if I'm openly gay? But they kicked me out only for that reason, not because I was doing something with somebody that uh, somebody complained about. The person who I fooled around with, he was found out to be gay, so they, they suspected him, and he then turned my name in. And that's how the things worked at that time. But this is a left-wing socialist group. So the anarchist at Alternate U on 14th Street, having heard about that, welcomed me in and let me join their board of directors. And uh, because my comrades, not only, not only did they kick me out of the YSA, the leaders went to the anti-war groups that I was very active in and tried to get those groups to not allow me to participate in their activities as well, which they rejected. Their own members rebelled against them because I was very active against the Vietnam War and was for years committed and dedicated, etc., so the, but the leadership, Jack Barnes, was, was absolutely upset that I was allowed to stay in the Student Mobilization Committee Against the War and these other groups. We hear a bit more about Alternative U, which John mentioned in part two. At this time, there also wasn't much of a gay rights movement. What there was called itself the homophile movement, deliberately not using the word homosexual in order to try to combat the idea that gay people were obsessed with sex. And there was a difference between the East Coast and the West Coast. Um, they had a different philosophy and, and views on the homophile movement. Uh, on the West Coast, it was more personal, supportive, building a community, identity, etc. On the East Coast, it was only around legal rights. It was, it was only around that, not around identity and building community. The main homophile group for women was called the deliberately innocuous-sounding Daughters of Belitis, uh, Belitis being a fictional lesbian from 19th century French poetry. The um, Daughters of Belitis was what you might call an assimilationist group. The idea was we were trying to prove to the world, and the gay men's organizations did the same, that we were uh, just as good as the rest of America, only somewhat different, and that we all wanted the same things with uh, the nice job, the house with the white pe picket fence and the pension and uh, that sort of thing. And it was all focused on kind of gay civil rights. We would have speakers coming to the Daughters of Belitis to tell us that we were okay. There was this one woman who was who you could count on for once a year, show up and uh, make a little speech about um, how we were okay psychologically and there was nothing really wrong with us. We were just different, like left-handed people are different from right-handed people. And then there was this lesbian couple that lived in New, uh, suburban New Jersey that would come in and tell you how to make your uh, lesbian marriage work. For men, the main homophile organization was called the Mattachine Society, uh, named after a troupe of masked French Renaissance performance societies, and it had the same assimilationist vibe as the Daughters of Belitis. 
in general, the groups were anxious not to make a fuss, um, but they did organize one protest a year. Every July 4th, well, for several July 4ths, um, the organizations, the gay organizations, had had a demonstration at Independence Hall in Philadelphia um, in front of the Liberty Bell. And we would, the women would have to put on skirts and the men would have to put on suits and ties. And here it is July 4th and it's hot. And we're marching along looking like middle Americans walking around with picket signs, equal rights for homosexuals. And I went to that once. That was the July 4th before uh, the Stonewall riot. And I felt like a complete idiot because in my normal life, uh, I mean, except for having to go to work, uh, I did not dress like that. And the guys didn't either. <laughs> and uh, we were kind of pretending to be middle Americans and then these tourists who had come to Independence Hall uh, would stand around and look at us like we were creatures in a zoo and sort of eat their ice creams <laughs> and I thought I'm not doing this again um, it just was too phony. John once tried to attend one of these protests as well. My previous experiences with uh, the gay movement organized was not was not a good thing because it was very um, class oriented. It was it was uh, people who were the professionals looking for respect. Um, they didn't want kids like me. And in fact, I, if you have time, I can tell you, I went to a couple of demonstrations where I was rejected because I was too young. So um, and in 1967, they they had their annual. Um, walk around uh, Independence Hall protesting uh, uh, discrimination. And it'd be about a dozen pickets. And, um, and I went down there to protest against the Vietnam War, and they kept us in these little police corridors with, uh, wooden, with wooden horses at that time. And they kept us across the street from Independence Hall. Johnson was president. He was going to be speaking at Independence Hall. This is July 4th, 67. And so they had this annual day reminder where they had a dozen gay men and women marching around in a little picket line in an enclosed wooden horse. At the same time, for the same amount of space they got, there were 4,000 of us who were squeezed into the wooden horses to protest the war in Vietnam. And if you did not fit in that wooden horse, you were not allowed to be part of the demonstration. It was a way of keeping the numbers down in opposition to the war. Well, two people, David McReynolds, and myself, we went over to join as well the gay protest. David was open, so he had his suit on, and he joined. He was in his 30s or 40s then. I was 18, no suit, wearing jeans, and it was very brave for me to try to go over and join the, the protest because I'm in front of all my friends. You know, I'm not really out at that time. I was in the closet. So... So I went over to join the, the demonstration. They wouldn't let me on because, one, I was underage. You had to be 21. Two, I wasn't wearing a suit because women had to wear dresses and men had to wear, wear suits. And you had to carry a sign, and you could not say anything. Those demonstrations, you had to remain totally silent and to let only the spokesperson do the talking. So no yelling, no slogans, walk around in a circle, and if you're underage, you're not allowed to. A year or so later, John tried to attend an event at the Mattachine Society at a hotel, but he couldn't afford the entrance fee. And when I went to the hotel, I, you know, found these, all these professional men in their suits. <laughs> and, of course, there was a charge to go in. You know, I didn't have any money. So they looked at me like, you know, I'm from another planet, you know, because class-wise, you know, I'm just this, you know, because they didn't know I was gay because, you know, I, I said I had a lot of big muscles then. I was tough. So basically, they, they saw me, you know, as, as somehow the help, you know, when I showed up at that hotel. The bar was up, but, but it was like this hostility, like, you know, who is that, you know? Now, of course, when they weren't in that hotel, when they were out on the streets, or that, they'd be more than happy to pick me up. You know, these are the guys I met who are more than happy to take me to bed. And then as soon as they get their sex over with, 
I'm out the door, and there's no communication. If they were scared to death of seeing me. You know, I mean, just to give you a little thing to, to understand the time. People I met for sex would not acknowledge even knowing me or seeing me on the street, not because uh, I was working class, but because people would think that they would be spotted as being gay. That was the fear, that, you know, you don't even stand with somebody who's also gay because then you could be identified as such. That was the fear. That was the internalized self-oppression that was going on then, the great fear. Laws against gay and gender non-conforming people basically meant the only bars which would cater for them were run by organized crime. There were raids in the bars, and of course the bars for both men and women were in New York owned by the mafia, and they paid protection to the cops. The uh, that didn't always work because at times the cops would just raid the bars and the pretense of, quote, cleaning up the city. And um, in order to get into the bars, you had to pay sometimes an entrance fee. You had to pay an entrance fee to get into an interior room where you could dance with another woman. And you got to buy watered down drinks. There was a lot of pressure to buy drinks. And this wasn't suitable. It didn't suit me at all. I didn't dress right. I didn't look uh, the right kind of uh, butch or femme. And I never had any success in the bars in getting to meet other people. At the time, it was against the law to allow gay people to congregate in your business. Um, so if you allowed gay people to congregate in your business, you were basically aiding and abetting in criminal activity. So the bars that allowed gays to congregate on, on different levels were mainly in New York, where I was, op operated by the mob, because they, of course, paid off the cops, and, uh, and this is nothing new. Uh, paying off the cops was not just in New York, but it was in most countries and, and most cities that had such places. But, but regularly, there would be police raids, to keep clear of who's in charge and to keep us in our place. So I was too young to go into the bars, but the other reason I didn't go into the bars is because I had no money. So um, I was a working class kid. I had no money at all. I would hang out on the streets on Christopher Street and down at the piers and have sex in the trucks and go to the open parks because that was the thing that was common for most working class kids. It still goes on today. If you don't have money, you are more limited in access for many things in life, uh, which includes sex. Unlike John, Martin was old enough to go to bars. The street queens are my crowd, the Scare Drake street queen. They were interesting, they were fascinating, they were great raconteurs. Uh, they were just fascinating. I was absolutely obsessed with them and was glad to be part of them. It looked like in a very oppressive world, we had created a comfort zone amongst us and around us because we understood each other very, very well. The Stonewall Inn was in Greenwich Village, a historically bohemian neighbourhood on the lower west side of Manhattan, which was the centre of gay life in the city. The Stonewall is actually still there, although it's not the same as it was. After it was shut down, it later reopened in 1990, occupying half of its original space. It's situated on Christopher Street, near its intersection with 6th Avenue, which runs west to the piers, which at the time were full of delivery trucks at night and were a popular cruising spot. The Stonewall was Martin's favourite place, because it had one key difference with almost every other bar in the city. Oh yes, because the Stonewall was the only dancing bar, so everybody went there just to dance. I mean, it was such a novelty, it was such a wonderful thing to do. One of the freest things you could do would be on a dance floor in a gay situation. It was unheard of publicly. Well, Stonewall was centrally located in the village, so it could uh, people that would come to the village could stop by, or you could check it out. It was easy to get to. It was a gay-friendly neighborhood, the most gay-friendly in the whole city. And we would go there maybe at 11 or later, especially more in the winter than in summer. And it was a completely mixed crowd. There was only one bar for dancing, and everybody had to share it. So, And the bar was not a very attractive place. It was, uh, they didn't have any running water. So if you knew, you would order bottled beer because you would not get sick that way in case, you know, that could happen. 
And it was really a dump. It was controlled by the mafia, but it was wonderful for us because it was our place. And it was, uh, since there were so many groups of people in there, you would find your own crowd mixed in with all these other crowds in the bar, which made it a very exciting place to see other lifestyles within the gay community, even if you were sometimes hostile to those lifestyles. But things would break down. We're all gay and we're all friendly. Something worth pointing out at this stage is about language. So at the time, uh, terminology about transgender people was different to how it is now. So the general term for people assigned male at birth who were gender non-conforming to varying degrees was drag queen. So this term included men in drag, but also people who in current parlance would be trans women. At the time, the only people who were generally considered trans women, then more usually called transsexual, were people who'd undergone gender reassignment surgery. So these were the only people legally allowed to wear women's clothes, whereas for drag queens and trans women who either didn't want or could not afford gender reassignment surgery, it was illegal. So police would check people's genitals during police raids to determine who they could arrest. Due to recent disputes between people who oppose rights for trans people, transphobes, and supporters of trans rights, the identity of numerous people involved in the Stonewall Rebellion has been disputed. Again, because of the time this took place, many of the participants didn't refer to themselves as trans because that term wasn't in use, Um, but other participants later described themselves as trans when the terminology did come into use. So it's clear that many trans people were involved in the riots, as were non-transgender gay men and lesbians. Anyway, here Martin explains more about the different subcultures represented at the Stonewall. One of the biggest ones were the black drag queens, and they were very, very important because they were very, very hip. There was no doubt about it. And they controlled the jukebox. So they were always around the jukebox. And if you went to the jukebox and played something they didn't like, you would never get to the jukebox again. It was sort of the way so they used to, at the time people used to control the telephone at prison. I mean, that was the center of the very center of the bar. It's nerve center was that jukebox. And uh, they controlled it and they would vogue to songs. And they would always be entertaining. They were always on. So they would absolutely agree. Everybody agreed that they could control that. Uh, The part of the bar in which you walked in, which did not face the dance floor, was more like a regular bar as opposed to an open dance bar. That was uh, the A-gays, the guys in suits, who were very hostile to the scared drag queens. By scared drag queens, I mean... Queens that looked like Boy George. They weren't in full drag. They were just were gender benders, so to speak. As well as providing music to dance to, the jukebox at the Stonewall served another function. Uh, the jukebox was also used to answer people. I mean, if you had an argument, you could always find a song on the jukebox that could answer that person. I remember two drag queens were having a fight over who looked better. And one of them triumphantly went up. The first one could get there to the jukebox to play they nothing like the real thing baby and would snap her fingers and let the song talk for her and you would assume that uh, she was the real thing so so the the music was used in many different ways not just for dancing but for this kind of uh, communication or expression really i should say police raids on gay bars in new york happened a lot however they usually gave advance notification to the mafia and undertook the raid at a mutually convenient time so as not to cause that much disruption. But this raid was different. This time, authorities wanted to shut down the Stonewall for good, and they planned to raid it at its busiest time, in the early hours of Saturday, the 28th of June, 1969. As is quite common in historical events, there are multiple different narratives about what exactly began the riot, but Stonewall is pretty unique in that its specific trigger is hotly debated, basically because of transphobes trying to erase the role of trans people in the rebellion, and on the flip side, others trying to highlight it. So some people say it was started by Marsha P. Johnson, uh, a legendary black trans activist, although she herself said she arrived after it started. Others credit Puerto Rican trans woman Sylvia Rivera, although she wasn't actually present on the first night of the rioting. Multiple first-hand accounts, supported by journalists from the Village Voice who were on the scene, state that a key trigger outside the bar was a lesbian described as a, quote, typical New York butch, being arrested and calling on the crowd which had formed around her to, quote, do something. In 2008, biracial drag king performer uh, Stormé de Lavery, known as a guardian of lesbians in the village, stated that she was this individual. Still other people credit an unnamed Puerto Rican drag queen outside the bar, putting her fist in the air and yelling gay power. 
The police officer in charge of the raid stated that what started the oppositional atmosphere inside the bar was trans women and drag queens resisting the genital checks, and others still credit lesbians resisting intrusive body searches. In a chaotic situation involving lots of different people in various locations, different people are going to see different things. 50 years on, there is no way of knowing what the exact first trigger of the riot was, and most likely there was no single event from which everything else followed. But what is completely clear is that trans people, lesbians, gay men and gender non-conforming people, many of them people of colour, and pretty much all of them working class were involved and fought together. Anyone who's been involved in a riot knows that it's not an individual act, it is a collective act, where lots of people start acting together as one. So, bearing all that in mind, this is what Martin saw himself that night. Well, what happened was me and my best friend, who's like a platonic lover, Bertie, Bertie Rivera, we were going to go to Stonewall at about, I forgot what time, but we were going there, that was our plan. But the point with Stonewall is you never could be sure you're going to get in because they control the bar from the door and they didn't want the bar to tip too many drag queens, too many butch, too many this, too many that. They wanted to keep the bar open so that everyone, it would just not tip and become a certain type of bar. So it would just become, you know, the bar that uh, sort of seemed like welcomed everybody, but it really didn't. They really were controlling who was in the bar and who could be there that night. And one of my friends, um, who was very similar to me and Birdie, couldn't get in. So we knew we weren't going to get in. So we were on a stoop up from the bar, deciding what we were going to do. And there was a ruckus. Someone behind me said something about a raid. And the crowd behind me got thick and was heading towards Sixth Avenue. Many people to get out of that area. Because, I mean, all of a sudden, the street was ablaze with uh, what used to be called the uh, bubble lights then on the police cars, the paddy wagon. And, and turmoil and confusion. And so we ran over to the bar and they were already taking people out to put in the paddy wagons. As soon as I got there, uh, a queen kicked one of the policemen in the shoulder for the paddy wagon. I only saw her high heel and he went in and well, just kept beating her because you could hear flesh again and bone against that metal, which was a brutal thing to see. I mean, right off the bat. I mean, we knew they were brutal, but they usually weren't brutal in front of us, in front of a huge crowd, in an important intersection. This was unusual. And what happened was we formed a semicircle around the bar and around the police and was watching the proceedings. The drag queens were coming out and waving, other people were coming about in tears, some coming about ashamed, all the people that are usually caught in there. But this was not an unusual thing. When there was a raid, we normally went to see who was in there. It was almost like a shot in front of them that we uh, were glad it wasn't us and now we could watch a show. There was no this sense of unity as it would be within a couple of hours, which was new. And he, uh, he the paddy um, wagon went away. The crowd was just lulling. This huge policeman, a very ugly man, uh, in front of me turned around to us and said, all right, you saw the show, because this was routine. Now get the fuck out of here. And he turned around again because he knew we were going to move and leave because that's what we always did. But this time we didn't. Nobody communicated. Nobody said a word. But everybody took a step forward. And I couldn't see the expression on anybody's face because we were all looking at him. But something must have happened in the crowd. Something must have happened to our faces. Because as he turned around to repeat the order, and for the last time as far as he was concerned, he blinked, gulped, and we knew we got him. He moved back. The right was on. The right was on in different sections at different times of this semicircle or amphitheater because it was enough provocation for every small group along the line. And that was our provocation. But when he ran, it was almost instinctual, my way animals think, to give chase. And we did. And he um, and the others, they locked themselves into the um, bar. And the crowd just went crazy. We started throwing pennies at first because they were coppers. They were called, you know, made of copper as an insult to them, and then it got worse. So just to clarify here, at this point there are around six male police officers in the bar, as well as two undercover women officers whose job it was to identify who various people were in the bar to be arrested. Um, the male officers had been searching and taking IDs from people inside the bar, um, but now the officers outside had fled into the bar and they barricaded the doors shut to try and keep out the now angry crowd which had formed outside. 
the two journalists from the Village Voice, which back then was a very homophobic publication, hid inside as well, fearing for their safety. And then uh, bricks started appearing and, and, and stones started appearing and, and everything we had in our pockets that we could afford to lose was thrown at the bar. And someone got lighting fluid and just put it on the door and set it afire. At this same time, John O'Brien was nearby. I normally spent every Friday and Saturday night on 8th Street and 6th Avenue, which is the Avenue of Americas, talking politics. And I would spend several hours there and then go down Christopher Street and have sex. Well, on that night was, was the police sirens you could hear, and people were running down the street and away towards the subway. And, of course, I ran to it. <laughs> um, because uh, I was political. So I wasn't there when they first when they first pulled people out. I wasn't there. I was still down the street. So when I got there, the the rebellion had already started with the cops running into the bar, and so they locked themselves in the bar uh, because they were freaking out over the anger. What they had never had before was gay people coming together, united, and focused their anger on the cops. The cops who before that were able to pick off people. There was no response. The, they would be easy victims. They would be, uh, you know, just go along with whatever is being handed out and dealt to them. Uh, because of that psychology of accepting being a victim. That night, there were people who didn't. So it started with yelling at the cops and then pushing the cops and then uh, throwing things at the cops first some loose change, and then cobblestones, uh, which were big and heavy from uh, taking out of the street. This one queen, Miss New Orleans, and in a riot, it's very hard to see one thing. It's a kaleidoscope. You're always moving. It's kinetic. And this one queen, which I'll never forget, Miss New Orleans, was on top of this window ledge. And I never saw a face of determination like that. Only faces of the abolitionist John Brown. And that's what she reminded me of. The intensity in her face to write, I guess, the wrong she felt was amazing. I mean, I just couldn't believe how how determined she was determined. She was one of the great heroes. She jumped down from the ledge, went to a a parking meter, started pulling it out, almost did it herself, but other people helped then, and they started trying to break the door down. I didn't really realize they really were trying to get into that bar. I thought this was merely, you know, something to do, something that we could... um, to, to relieve the um, anxiety and frustration. But they were really trying to get in. It would have been a disaster had they. But the riot kept going. Inside the bar, the police experienced what it was like to be on the other end of the type of power relationship they were used to, where instead of them being able to intimidate and be violent towards others, they were the ones outnumbered, and they were shitting themselves. Uh, a couple of them were war veterans, and later said it was the most scared they've ever been. But they did have guns, and they did later say they, they were prepared to fire on the crowd if they'd managed to get inside the bar. One of those people trying to break in was John. And I got involved with the parking meter, where we took the meter out of the grid. It had been partially loosened by a car who hit it, so it was basically already bent. So we took that out, and we used that on the doors at the Stonewall to try to get the cops inside. So I was... You know, not an average gay guy. I was pretty butch. So, and the and there's the other people included on that parking meter. I don't know all their sexuality, but I do know that they were angry and they had enough. It was the right time, the right place. It was at a time when people were challenging government authority at all levels. Uh, it it was because of the '60s, and especially because of the civil rights movement that we were able to do what we could do there. So taking a, a uh, parking meter and using it as a battering ram to try to get to kill the cops would um, today be a shocking thing for most people. So 50 years ago, trust even, <laughs> was even more shocking that gay people were willing to do Now that a fight back had started, it took on a momentum of its own. And the whole point of the right, somehow we all realized without having leadership, was to keep it going. And this is what the police did not want. But the geography favored us, and we were like the American Indians. We knew the forests and the plains better than the police did, because we really knew the village. 
<clears throat> every time they chased us to break the riot up, we were able to evade them and come back to the same spot because of the geography of the village at that, at that point. And also because we were attacked so much that we didn't realize that we had become pretty well trained in some aspects of being urban guerrillas. I mean, we always, if we were attacked uptown or something, going to the movies, we could always break up and find each other. Nine out of ten times we'd find each other. This came in very handy <clears throat> for when we were dispersed and then we had to regroup. The police inside the bar called for backup and eventually arrived in the form of the tactical police force, riot officers with clubs, guns, helmets and shields. I think the most famous incident in the riot, and nothing is louder in a riot than silence, is the entire area went silent, except for this kind of hoof. There was a marching sound, a thumping sound, a stormtrooper sound, and the crowd opened up and there was the tactical police force. And they were really designed to fight real riots. I mean, the riots that were uh, uh, plaguing America all over the country, something righteously so, but nonetheless. And they did not know what to do. Here they confronted a bunch of queens, and we didn't know what to do. Here they were, like decked out in shields and, and head masks and everything you could think of. And that moment, we had to do something. We was always having to do something to keep the show going. We all linked arms and started singing, we are the village girls. We wear our hair in curls. And we did a kick, a roquette, a roquette kick. And that shocked them, but that forced them to charge. And they did charge, and they did break us up. But it was very, very campy. And uh, an amazing part of the, the uh, riot to see the two groups look at each other in absolute wonder. They got the tactical patrol force to come, which is the emergency. It's like today's um, SWAT teams, etc without the guns, but it was there, it was there, the police who normally deal with rioting and political demonstrations, etc. Basically, a large crowd was watching. Now, in that crowd were many gay and lesbian people and allies. So they consciously blocked the streets the first night and over the next few nights, preventing the police cars from getting down the streets to us. In addition to the telephone interview we did with Martin, we went to the Stonewall Inn and the surrounding streets and had a really fascinating chat about what happened over those nights. One of the questions I asked him was if he saw people get injured. The street where we spoke was quite busy, so there's a fair bit of background noise, but hopefully it's still comprehensible. Yes, and the trouble was that it was mostly friendly fire because we weren't exactly baseball players. <laughs> so you saw a queen throw a brick. It didn't land over there. It landed on some other queen's head, but nobody minded it. We did help bandage them, whatever we could do for them. Nobody minded, they were just escorted out of the... It was actually very funny. They were escorted <laughs> out of there, and you know, they had tears in their eyes, but they weren't sorry. No one was sorry. So we stopped throwing bricks, because you know, and we threw orange peels and things like that, because like, you know, we were just having, the cops weren't hitting us, but we were certainly knocking these queens down like bowling pins. On that first night of the riots, property damage was pretty much limited to the Stonewall Inn itself, as protesters broke all the windows, tried to batter down the door, set fire to it, and tossed bottles of burning liquid like improvised Molotov cocktails inside, which the police had to keep putting out. Other than that, people focused on resisting the police, and would reform kick lines and sing, wait till the police charged, and then break at the last moment and reform elsewhere. Clashes continued until the small hours. The riot kept going on. They didn't catch us. It just died down. I remember sitting on a stoop and I saw a queen across another stoop, exhausted, her head down and her, her knees. And six feet away, a cop also exhausted, not bothering with her. Uh, the street was smoky from the fires that were set and broken glass that was smashed, stores that were swiped. And all this glass, like diamonds glittering in the street, and it took on the effect of diamonds when the sun came up because it all glittered. It was actually one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. Sadly, it came out of such a tragic event. But nonetheless, I went home and I thought, we're gonna pay dearly for this. Now I thought, we are gonna just pay for this. But when I got home, my father congratulated me. <clears throat> it must've been on the radio. The next day, word of news traveled throughout the city and the whole city knew whether it was in the paper or not, because this was the kind of thing that people are interested in generally. And things had already changed. Unlike a lot of LGBTQ people's families at the time, Martin's dad always supported him. My dad was very supportive. My dad, um, you know, had seen the streets, knew the streets, and understood the streets. He was a cab driver since 1933. 
And, uh, he, you know, there was a cookie jar with cash in it. And he told me, you know, if you're ever arrested, because he was sure I was going to get arrested, uh, just call and here's the money to get you out. I'll leave it in here. So you all, you know that we have it. And all you, so he was very supportive because I could go out and uh, if there was a confrontation with the police, I could be least worried of all my friends <clears throat> because I had support. But when I got home, my dad just said, you know, the terminology was different than he just said, it's about time you fags did something because he had seen all this oppression all these decades and never thought we really were doing anything really wrong since it was consensual, private and nobody's business, he thought. So it was a, he was an amazing man for that, as a working class man, as a man who trained boxers and trained guard dogs. Very, very butch man, was very, very sensitive to me. He never held it against me. He didn't think it was all that, you know, being butch and being, you know, what society thinks a man should be. And I must say that the Stonewall riot was not an anti-straight riot, it was an anti-police riot. So gays in their hearts didn't have it in for straight people. They really wanted a better world, even if it was just better for themselves at first. They were in the right trajectory, their hearts were in the right place. After that first night, Friday night, rioting continued until Wednesday night. Then, LGBT people who took part in the riot, as well as others, started organising, forming the Gay Liberation Front and organising a protest on the anniversary of the Stonewall Rebellion, which became Pride. All of that is in part two. Our Patreon supporters can listen to part two now. For everyone else, it'll be out next week. All right. what I say. Putting together this podcast takes a lot of work, which may not always be obvious, so we thought we might explain a bit about how it works. So at any point, we're working on several episodes at once. We spend lots of hours researching a subject first off, getting hold of and reading books, watching films and documentaries, and reading everything online we can find. Sometimes it takes us quite a while to find people to interview, and then some people are happy to be interviewed right away, but it can take us months uh, with some people to build a relationship um, to the point where they're happy to go on the record and be interviewed. After the interviews, we begin editing, uh, which can be really time consuming. Uh, Generally, we have to do three or four runs through before we get it right. Finally, we write a narrative, record that, uh, do a final draft edit, which we then listen through, make final changes, and then we listen through that one last time to double check. All told, it's quite time consuming. We are taking time out from our day jobs through 2019 to be able to devote enough time to do this, uh, to try and do a good job. But ultimately, we're only going to be able to keep dedicating this amount of time if we get more support from you, our listeners, on Patreon. Patreon supporters get early access to episodes, bonus audio, free and discounted merch, and more. So if you can, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory. If you can't, that's cool too. Please just give us a review on Apple Podcasts or share our episodes on social media so we can get more listeners. We've produced some Stonewall 50th Anniversary merch to help support our work. Check that out on our website, linked to in the show notes. This narrative was recorded by Jesse French. The music for this episode is Stand Up For Your Rights by the International Gay Society, courtesy of Chapter Music. Links to stream it and buy it in the show notes. Um, It's from a great album of songs from the gay liberation movement um, in the 70s, so check that out. As always, thank you so much to all of our patrons, whose generous support enables us to keep making this podcast and running WCH. Catch you next time.